is short and nice uh, introduction. So my name indeed is Petro Fedichev and I had a decent job. I've been doing theoretical physics. And then something happened and uh, more than 15 years ago, somebody showed me that uh, there are mammals that uh, do not age. And I got really interested into this situation. So when I was small, I was reading about uh, primitive creatures that are not aging, but I didn't care because I had uh, high esteem of our mammalian uh, ancestry. But um, since then, I, I learned that in 21st century, uh, there, have, uh, there appeared to be first experimental evidence suggesting that uh, certain mammals do not age. And as we speak, more and more animals of that kind uh, showing up in uh, databases. So on this graph, uh, I mean, that, that's what brought me into the field. So on the left, you have uh, mortality, not your usual log plot. I mean, actual mortality is a function of age uh, in humans. So note the huge dynamic range here. So humans exhibit uh, a huge variation of mortality. This is almost unprecedented uh, among other animals. And then on the, on the right, you have uh, naked mole rats. So this is a picture from paper by Kalika by Google. So they published a new life uh, because I think they wanted to, to, to insist on the title that says that these guys are defying the Gompertz law. Uh, there is no log on the vertical scale. You can see that uh, over the long, very long time, there is no appreciable change in mortality, measurable mortality in these animals. So my question was always like, if I want to do something about aging, I should be looking at uh, the largest effects possible. So to me, the difference between these two curves is the largest effect possible. So if we ever want to increase human life by a large margin uh, without doing trials and errors, which I think is miserable, uh, we should have a theoretical framework to understand how the curve on the left is different from the curve on the right. And this is quite a multi-year uh, journey, which I want to, 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 to tell you about. So my interest was twofold. So I learned about these creatures. And then at the same time, I was reading uh, works by Stuart Kaufman. I was doing physics of strongly correlated systems. And when I was a student, people were telling me that uh, uh, young men study physics because there are, guy, there are physicists turning biologists, but there are no medics or biologists turning to physics. Uh, this is the counter example. So Stuart Kaufman is the guy who was trained as a medic, as a medical doctor, uh, who turned out to be a, a very decent uh, uh, theoretical physicist. So when this guy is writing something, he's very old right now, but I'm reading. So the, 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 the work that essentially started Jira is this. So the guy in 2008, I believe, the guy took uh, kind of first transcriptomic data that was available in mass. And he tried to reconstruct regulatory networks from transcriptomics. And uh, to his surprise, he found that with experimental accuracy, he couldn't see if those regulatory ne networks are stable or not. So it looks like almost all living creatures operate at the boundary between stability and instability. And when I learned about that, and when I learned about naked mole rats, at least as a guide to I, I started thinking that maybe those guys who are unstable, close to the boundary and unstable are those who are, let's put that in quotes, normally aging. And those guys who are stable are presumably those guys who do not age. So, I mean, I have never presented this, uh, uh, this talk in the way I am doing now. So please don't look, you know, in these equations uh, too carefully. These are kind of metaphorical uh, ideas. So usually if you want to approach this kind of things, you can do it formally, but I like uh, model problems. So the first model problem that I tried to solve was this. So I presumed that um, every living creature is a very sophisticated soup of things that are there uh, in the right time and in the right place. So assume that there are a certain number of, of errors, for example, missing or, or over-present proteins like E, e, e with the index P, and there are certain genes that are working correctly or dysregulated. So these are errors in the proteome and then genome. So I simply asked myself a question. So if I have an error somewhere in the protein, probably this uh, missing or overpresent protein is deregulating a certain gene. So if it's not removed, <laughs> it will deregulate a bunch of genes. At the same time, if there is any dysregulated uh, gene, it would produce a bunch of misregulated proteins. And if it's not removed, it will produce a bunch of proteins. So 
you can in fact write, write those equations and uh, they, they are so simple that you can actually solve them. So you would find that uh, depending on the parameters like this C is the, uh, is the rate uh, how uh, errors in proton are removed. Uh, delta is the rate uh, how the errors in the genome are removed. Um, this uh, beta is the rate how quickly proteins are translated and G is the number of genes, whatever. So if you solve this very simple problem, you would find that depending on the parameters of this very simple network, this is what's called the mean field solution, you would find that if the repair systems are working very well, if C and delta are very large, then you are in the stable mode. If any error appears, it's extinguished before it manages to produce more errors. So error amplification rate is below one, below. Uh, and if your rates, extinguishing rates of your errors in proton and in genome are not large enough, then you are in the unstable mode. So what's interesting is the number of regulatory errors in the unstable mode is going up exponentially, which is kind of what is looking like aging, right, in this system. And if you are in the stable mode, the number of errors doesn't grow, which means that you can kind of live forever in this uh, situation. So probably that corresponds to non-aging individuals. It's very simple, but it simply gives you an idea that without inventing any superstructure, novel biological mechanisms, just by changing parameters of the system in a continuous way, you can actually cross between stable and unstable regime. And that's what evolution is probably doing uh, all the time. So just uh, for fun and scientific curiosity, let me just give you the, the, the flavor of the language that could be used if you want to, to solve the actual problem. So, uh, well, actually we have lots of variables. We have much more variables in living systems that we can ever measure which means that we always look at subsets of variables. Let's call them X. It could be DNA mutilation, proteome level, protein levels, transcript levels, whatever you want. So obviously they satisfy some kind of dynamic equations. So if one is changing, then other things are changing at a certain rate. And it's not unreasonable to believe that there is some kind of a steady state, X naught, and you can actually expand all these equations uh, in linear regime. So they, they are there where you would have this connect on whatever metrics that tells you how change in one transcript or in one protein level changes all the other. In the language of dynamics system theory, that's called Jacobian. So this Jacobian is one of the most important objects uh, for any dynamic system. And depending on the spectra of spectrum of this Jacobian, you can have totally different dynamic properties. So on the left, I, uh, I wrote, uh, I actually plotted in a schematic way the eigen, eigen uh, values of this Jacobian. So this is very huge. It's, it's a huge matrix. I, nobody can even write this matrix. Nobody can measure all the matrix elements of this matrix. So we should think about it in the language of statistical mechanics of matrices here. So definitely somewhere on the left on this uh, uh, on this uh, eigen value uh, complex plane, you have lots of eigen values with large uh, real eigen value. These things correspond to overdamped uh, stress responses, right? So you disturb the system and it's going back to the north. And then close to zero, as I have just shown you in the model example, and that's what Kaufman have, has demonstrated uh, a while ago, there would be a few eigen uh, values of this matrix that are very close to zero. They correspond to long responses or slow dynamics of the system. And aging is definitely one of them. So if you know the spectrum of the matrix, if you know all the left and, right and the right eigen vectors of this matrix, you can always expand the solution in the right eigen vectors of this matrix, as it is called, as it is written below. And then you can write the effective solution for the, so once again, these are multidimensional vectors, lots of variables to measure, but they are moving due to a finite number of mode, uh, of mode variables. So the eigen modes, Eigen vectors that are close to the uh, zero, close to zero, are called critical. They also called central manifold. Whatever there is a lot of nasty language there. But what most important is that all the motions that are quick to relax, you don't see them in the data, right? Because it disturbs the system and the system is going back. You don't have even time to measure them. So you always measure a very few that dominate the motion. That's, by the way, the reason why the dimensionality reduction works in systems biology very well. So for those very few 
you can generate these very few mode functions like this z a and the slow dynamics of very complex systems is actually dominated by very few of them so let's think about one uh, for simplicity so this mode function uh, undergoes uh, uh, dynamics uh, stochastic dynamics and an effective potential and a regulator potential that can have actually just two forms it could be stable close to zero or unstable close to zero depending on the sign of the leading eigenvalue of the uh, of the jacobian matrix of this uh, system and uh, believe me this this is probably the most complex slide here so what's most important is that by small variation in the system's parameters without inventing any systems you can actually cross remember by kaufman you are close to stability and stability reach which means that you can cross from stable to unstable and as i said that's what evolution is apparently doing so for example, if uh, this mode variable uh, belongs to the unstable regime, then you simply exponentially disintegrate. That's what most, most probably small creatures are doing. And if on the other side, uh, the dynamics of the system belongs to the stable regime, then you can oscillate in this uh, stable, near the stable basin of attraction for a very long time, unless fluctuations would throw you away over the protective barrier. And that would correspond to age independent mortality in this system. So, well, very simple approach actually gives you the, uh, the description, at least theoretically, how uh, the same system, the same mammal can be evolutionary driven from aging to non-aging regime. What's most important is that when this uh, eigenvalue is very close to zero, which means that the aging is very slow, much smaller than any molecular scales, then uh, the motion is dominated just by exactly one mode. And uh, this mode variable is approximately given by the principal component. So that's the reason why principal components is very successful in generating biomarkers of aging. So this idea of small uh, central manifold of these dynamic systems is very, uh, is, very, is very well suited for modern machine learning. So as I said, close to this uh, criticality, so this regime where this eigenvalue is crossing between stability and instability, it's called critical regime. Close to criticality, there are very few important variables that are described in long-term dynamics of systems. And that's what we can exactly uh, study with modern generative AI uh, very well. So here is the example, what we've done in mice uh, recently, we took uh, longitudinal uh, medical, let's call it medical uh, data from mice. These were readouts from blood variables. So we used a network in order to predict uh, very few uh, latent variables, central manifold of this animal, and then use them in order to predict the future state of health of this animal. And if you train the simplest model that trains just one critical variable, it's shown on the right, you see that this variable is going exponentially up uh, with age. And the red dots here are the animals of all ages that are scheduled to be killed in the lab. So you can literally see that in a lab, uh, mice die of, let's call it advanced biological age, right? So we, we really discover the variable that controls the health of these animals that is exponential uh, in age. The exponent is, by the way, is the same as the mortality rate uh, doubling uh, exponent from the Gompertz law, which kind of bridges what I've been telling you theoretically with what I can see practically. Because in mice, you can literally measure variables like molecular factors uh, that are exponential with the same exponent as the mortality rate uh, acceleration. Just to give you a flavor, in this model, in the model of this kind, there is no chronological time. So mice generate biological time due to dynamic instability, right? So they develop exponential amplification of regulatory errors. There is no chronological time. I mean, the errors simplify errors. That's how you get exponent. And on the right, you can see uh, the actual experimental data, how, this, um, how, how the total number of senescent cell measured in the animal by Lucifer's reporting model is actually better correlating to the machine learning inferred uh, critical variable, it's also called the other parameter in physics, then to chronological age. We really can get biological time from longitudinal measurements with a little bit of physics and uh, not too sophisticated uh, network. Now, in practical terms, if you don't have stability, if you are unstable, that means that if I take you out of equilibrium, you will never get away, you wouldn't know what is the equilibrium situation. You will never relax back 
to the equilibrium, which means on the left, if I track this biological age, whatever this order parameter uh, in mice, and if I apply an intervention, a short intervention, hit and run intervention at some point in time that reduces this biological age, by nature of not having stability, these mice will always be below. I mean, they will keep aging at the same rate, but from a lower base. They wouldn't know how to catch up with the control because there is no stability, which means that in unstable systems, you can produce rejuvenation. And that's what exactly we see in experiments. So on the right, these are our experiments. You can see the biological age on the vertical axis. You can see the horizontal axis. That is the age of animals in, in, in weeks. And you can see that uh, the first two points on the left are untreated animals. And then we have an experimental intervention that reduces this order parameter that acts against aging in mice. And you can see that for the rest of their lives, in situation where there is no therapeutic intervention present in these animals anymore, the treated group is always below the control. So this is very, to my taste, powerful demonstration of dynamic instability. Dynamic instability means that there is no there is no equilibrium, no homeostatic equilibrium, which means that you can rejuvenate. You wouldn't be able to do that in dynamically stable animals. Now, I think there is a very interesting, you know, formal mathematical, but also experimental confirmation of this theory, because it turns out that in animals that are dynamically unstable, there is no Gompertz law. So in fact, you can solve this uh, nonlinear Langevin equation to obtain analytically the mortality in these uh, model animals. So on the left, this is the uh, theoretical curve. So you can see that the mortality is first exponential up to the average lifespan. And then after average lifespan, the mortality saturates. It saturates at the same level as the Gompertz exponent. So on the right, I have actually the analytical solution for the survival curve uh, in, in these animals, which is uh, remarkably uh, can be confirmed in experiments. We've done these experiments ourselves just to test the theory. So on the left, you have C. elegans. These are worms. This is from our paper. As you can see, these are the survival curves. Uh, you have lots of mutants here. Uh, the range of lifespan is huge. This is 10 times variation in lifespan. And on the right, you have on the vertical axis, you have the plateau, the mortality at the plateau. And at the horizontal axis, you have the exponential feed of the mortality before the plateau. So remember, the theory was promising that these two quantities will be the same. So the level at the plateau is the same as the mortality Gompers exponent before the plateau. And you can see that uh, in experiments that are engaging worms uh, with uh, one order of magnitude difference in lifespan, there is a pretty strong correlation between these two things, which is kind of a good validation that at least worms are dying because of a simple dynamic instability. Not only worms have this problem. So on the left, uh, this is also, uh, there is, I mean, we're checking this because we want to be sure that these uh, models are not just uh, metaphorically correct. They also should be quantitatively correct. So on the left, uh, you can see the data from a mouse testing program. These are controls from mouse testing programs. These are thousands of animals. Of course, to, to look at such small effects, you should be looking at very large number of animals. You can see on the left that um, the, the, the dashed line is the Gompertz law, assuming that uh, mortality accelerates uh, up to infinity. You can see that there is a deficit in mortality in late in life in mice. So the mortality is going to the plateau instead of going exponentially. Uh, in humans, and that's that's now the, the biggest point, what's wrong with humans? In humans, there is no any sign of saturation of mortality at the average lifespan. In humans, mortality is well exponential. It's called, It was established in 1825, I believe, by Gompertz. Already in his times, when people started living uh, for a long time, the exponent is going up to more than 100 years so of age. There is no any sign of saturation of mortality at average lifespan. So that tells you that human aging is something else. And that's pretty disturbing, I would say, because we're using mice as a preclinical model of aging. So what's wrong with humans? So. I will try to list you first all the things that are wrong uh, with humans. First, 
if you do principal component analysis of all any signal you like it could be a signal from variable devices it would be dna methylation it would be transcriptomics whatever you would find that uh, if, if you plot every dot here is an average for a certain age group you wouldn't find a straight line remember that for dynamically unstable animals the first principal component always gives you the biomarker of aging it's not at all like that in humans. In humans, you can see different life staging. So if you project it to one axis, like on the right, uh, you would find that there is definitely growth, I don't know, 25 years. There is, by the way, uh, a theory by Jeffrey West. So we checked it in humans. Uh, there is this uh, universal theory of, uh, of growth uh, in animals. So the trajectory, how markers uh, like body weight or blood markers are going up or down uh, with age at the uh, time of growth. Uh, there is an analytic, analytical equation for that. So we checked it, but uh, it's not ours. So we just make sure that we understand the left part of this curve. Then uh, definitely something is going on after, let's say, 50 years old in humans on average. That's important that this is on average. But this is not exponential. Think about it. Think about your faces. Uh, think about faces of people you saw aging. Uh, there are two kinds of features. I mean, face is a great uh, omic, <laughs> I don't know, face omic signal. There are two kinds of features on your face. So first, there are features that are only changing one way. For example, size of your nose, distance between your eyes, size of your ears, they're only growing. Then there are features that are changing all the time. For example, the aspect ratio of your face. If you are tired or sick, you look older. If you sleep over, you look younger. So there are features that are associated with aging, but reversible. And there are features that are associated with aging, but apparently irreversible. What most important is that there are no exponent exponents there. If you fit, I mean, think about uh, face features. Uh, mortality rate doubling time in humans is eight years. Imagine what would happen to your face if, let's say, distance between your eyes would go up exponentially and double every eight years this would never work. I mean, our faces are much more stable than that. So trust me that uh, if you look at other signals like proteomics, transcriptomics, methylation, you would not find any molecular level feature that has exponential dynamics at the exponent that is matching mortality rate doubling time. Think about that. It's a huge problem because in biotech, we are acting at molecular level or at cellular level. If we don't, I mean, we have a problem, we have exponential mortality, we have exponential risk of diseases, but we don't have molecular level handles that ha follow the same dynamics, which means that we're in trouble if we are trying to actually intercept this dynamic. So we need to find an explanation how exponential dynamics of risks of diseases and death comes out from sub-exponential, let's put it like this, dynamics of measurable factors or actionable factors. So I cannot show it because there is no longitudinal data of that size. But uh, since we do have longitudinal data, uh, for example, we acquired longitudinal data sets from lab diagnostic companies. So we were acquiring the readouts from their blood tests for tens of thousands of people over 25 years for the whole duration of life of that company. So what we found Remember in mice, I was showing you that there are factors that are going up exponentially with the right exponent. In humans, that is not the case. If you measure anything, remember your weight. I think everyone, almost everyone has an idea about the trajectory of weight. You should remember that when you were younger, you had some equilibrium weight and that uh, there were fluctuations of that weight. And uh, if you were dieting or if you went to a gym you would be going down but once you stop doing that you would going back to the norm and once upon a while this equilibrium position of your weight would be changing most of the time to the bigger to the larger weight it's like an earthquake so it's like a reorganization in your body something happens and then your equilibrium position is new now whatever you do if you diet if you go to a gym you go down with your weight, but you never go back to the previous equilibrium position. So humans actually exhibit uh, stable fluctuations. And then once in a while, you have like earthquakes and you change your homeostatic equilibrium level, all people at different time points. So that's why cross-sectionally you have these smooth, nice curves, but uh, longitudinally, there is nothing like that. You have equilibrium, uh, quasi-equilibrium fluctuations that are damped and then you have this kind of catastrophic events. So 
what we can do. I mean, if you have, if you are metastable, if you have fluctuations, what you can do is that you can try to measure your recovery rate. So what is the recovery rate? So when you have a variable like your body weight, if you over eat, you will get larger. But if you stop eating, you will get back to your norm and that will take time. So you can actually measure by observing out the correlation times of your fluctuations of your body weight or C-reactive protein level, whatever you want. You can actually measure the recovery rate. So this is the, on the vertical axis uh, on the left. So the recovery rate that you measure from longitudinal fluctuations of your organism state variables, the rate is inverse time, right? So when the rate is going down with age, the inverse time is going up. So you can see that the recovery rate is going down linearly as we age. And it doesn't matter what you measure. So one of these uh, set of points was generated from wearable devices and another was generated from blood markers. I mean, how do I know that this recovery rate is actually recovery rate? This is just the autocorrelation time. So on the right, you have a result of less hu human, a humane experiment. This is the ultimate measure of your recovery time. This is inverse hospital stay. So this is direct measure of recovery time after a catastrophic event. And you can see that the recovery rate measured, let's say legally in a hospital, like your inverse hospital stay, is also going down as we age, and it crosses zero at about the same 120, 150 uh, years old, meaning that due to aging, we are about to lose our dynamic stability at about 120 years old due to aging. We are born, we are born naked mole rats, we are born dynamically stable. There is something else that is aging in humans that is not dynamic instability like in mice that destroys our ability to recover and once this ability is destroyed, we start disintegrating like mice, generating lots of uh, hallmarks of aging, age-related diseases and all. So the metaphoric representation of this process is on the left. And once again, this is not just a metaphor because um, every piece of this, uh, of this animation is actually tracked in the data. So you could have seen that our recovery time is going longer that means that our regulatory potentials are becoming shallower right if this is a continuous function most probably it means also that the height of the protective barrier that protects us from disintegration is also going down in the linear approximation if we are linearly shallower it means that we are also linearly less protected which if you read any textbook on physical kinetics would tell you that if your protective barrier is going down linearly your probability to get activated over this barrier is going up exponentially. So that's why this coupling between regulatory potentials of dynamically stable modes in humans with something else that is linear aging is actually the mechanism that generates exponential mortality and morbidity in humans. And just to, to tell you that I'm not totally wrong with this idea, on the right, you have a graph. This is actually from wearable devices. You cannot get this kind of data anywhere else. That's why we actually put up a GeroSense app that has zero user value, but it collects data of people that are happy to help aging research. So we measured on the right, uh, we measured the fraction of people who have long outlook relation times, meaning that they cannot recover quickly. And you can see that the fraction of people in the population, in the actual population, having long outlook relation time, larger than six months, is going up exponentially with age, with the exponent, that is exactly the mortality rate doubling time. So actually any population of people, actually a mixture of two populations, there are stable people, naked mole red like people, and there are people who cross the barrier, activated into unstable st state and start developing disease. That by the way, maybe explains why, for example, the chances to die from COVID are the same as uh, to die from surgery. They are going up exponentially double every eight years. Probably those people who are dynamically unstable, they had just very you know, less, much less chances to survive a catastrophic event. So now, what I have presented to you was phenomenology. Phenomenology is a funny science that is telling you how things go without telling why. Uh, you may know that from history of science, for example, that the phenomenology of superconductivity was discovered immediately and was given a Nobel Prize, was given for that, late actually. And then it took more than 20 years to find out how superconductivity works mechanistically. So there was uh, another Nobel Prize given to a bunch of people who actually discovered the theory, explained the mechanism, 
how super, superconductivity works. So what's, what is important is that phenomenology is a, a very harsh science. I mean, once established, it doesn't care about the mechanisms. So it tells you in there could be multiple uh, examples in nature where these different mechanisms are producing the same phenomenology. So now I'm trying to cross from how things happen in humans from phenomenology to mechanistic explanations. And for that, I'm going to molecular level signals. So remember my quest was to explain how molecular level changes that are not exponential at all generate exponential morbidity and mortality, because that's the thing that we need to find out if we want to live much longer than we're living right now. So here on the left, I present you an example of a simple principal component analysis of DNA methylation in human samples. So the first principal component on the left, top left, is linear in time. Very interesting, linear in time. So the variance of the first principal component is also linear in time. I mean, think quickly, what kind of processes generate linear mean and linear variance? And that's a Poissonian noise, right? This is a pretty good indication that this linear feature is actually a contribution of infinite number of microscopic insults, independent events of low probability that occur independent of each other and mounting up as a linear heap with increasing variance. Then the next principal component is not linear, not exponential. I can fit exponent there, but the exponent would be one order of magnitude smaller than it's required to explain mortality. And what's most important, the inverse variance of this principal component is actually going down linearly to zero and uh, diverges at the same 120 years old, now in DNA methylation. Remember I told you about the, uh, about the regulatory potential. If your regulatory potential is becoming shallower, your variance is going up. So that's exactly what we see here. So the second principal component is now a stress response. It's a dynamic process that has less and less recovery force as we age. The weak nonlinear shape of this potential is a good indication of nonlinear coupling. So most probably the linear feature is the driving force of human aging and it mounts the stress. I think I have a picture. Yeah, well, I'm sorry for that complicated picture, but I'll try to, I mean, th this is really the, the thing. So think about human body as a many, many, many systems that are interacting with each other. So imagine that these systems could be in kind of healthy and pathological state each. It could be mutation, no mutation, epimutation, no epimutation, diabetic state, non-diabetic state, innate immunity activated state, innate immunity deactivated state, right? This is a very sophisticated non-linear system. So imagine that I could try to classify all these systems uh, in our body by putting the soft systems, the systems that can change a lot, on top and the hard systems that are not changing much on the bottom. So what would happen is that those soft features are changing all the time. As we speak, for example, they are changing, right? Because for me to generate sounds, I have to activate lots of pathways. All these things are just moving back and forth all the time, right? And then there are things that are not allowed to change. So on the bottom of this slide, I have things that are protecting me from mutations that would kill me, right? Maybe those cancerous mutations that if come together would kill me. So what happens is that I have one trillion cells and even those things that are not very prob that are not very probable still happen, which means that those rare events are happening all the time and I have a linear increasing heap of those rare events. Those rare events are mounting, they go up linearly with age, they increase in variance with age because this is a Poissonian noise. But what most important is that since all of them are essentially benign, but since there are too many of them, they produce this heap of micro insults that are destroying the regulatory potentials for the soft systems, right? So by central limiting theorem, the net effect of those linear, of those independent events is a linear stress that is linearly affecting any regulatory potential in your body. And that's what exactly we have seen in blood samples, in DNA methylation everywhere. So biological processes are stressed by the compound effect of these rare events that appear in microscopic numbers. So you can actually, you can actually, you can frame it in machine learning uh, language as usual. So on the left, we have systems that were training in tens of millions of electronic medical records. 
which we slice electronic medical records. We use encoders in order to produce a bunch of uh, observable states. We also track biological age as a quantity that is keeping track of non-observable entities, right? We can never see all the damage that is in the body. We train these systems along life histories of humans across tens of millions of, of people. The systems are generating on the left a nice Poissonian biological age. So this is the distribution of the biological age in these systems in subsequent time frames, right? So we have each two time frames are separated by 10 years. And they also produce probabilities of failures in individual systems that are, uh, that are uh, affected by this biological age variable. And uh, these systems are clustered in unsupervised ways into ICD-10 chapters, right? Really, really, it's called in physics, it's called mean field. So you have a bunch of systems that are almost unrelated to each other. They vote if one such system fails, it increases biological age and the biological age helps other systems fail, right? So they are talking to each other. The effect of one failure on biological age is negligible, but together they produce an emergent variable that is biological age, that is a total damage in the system. And that damage helps to flip uh, other systems. And this is a very nice description of human health. These phenotypes can be used for whatever molecular level association studies, if you like. You can study, for example, everyone now is mad about metabolic diseases. You can find lots of targets for metabolic diseases. We're working with Pfizer and other companies, so I'm actually using these models. But once again, these models were created for one reason only. I didn't care about metabolic health. I cared to produce this Poissonian noise biological age. And we are looking for factors that are controlling the rate of the accumulation of biological age in human systems. Now, if biological age in humans is a result of many independent events, it's time to read statistical mechanics. This is the best statistical mechanics introduction that I have ever seen. That's, I'd say, people talk a lot about quantum mechanics, about general relativity. There is a kind of public discourse about that. But I think that thermodynamics, a second law of thermodynamics is the best probably piece of science that has happened uh, over the last maybe 200 years. Remember, people who invented thermodynamics didn't know about atoms and molecules. So the power, the universality of that science is so huge that if you see features of entropy or thermodynamics in systems, most probably you, I mean, you have very good priors and you have very good textbooks. So let, let, let me show, I mean, that will be the last part that will kind of, you know, hope, hopefully will be the last puzzle, piece of the puzzle. So look, remember, we have this linear feature, Poissonian feature. So what is that? I try to convince you that this is a result of multiple independent, individually rare, but microscopically present insults. I mean, how do I know that? Of course, I can either think that it's true or I can try to prove that this is true. And fortunately, we have what people didn't have when they built the steam engine. We have single cell omics, which means that I can literally track that the entropy is going up and the uh, linear feature is indeed a Poissonian noise feature. So this will have pretty lasting implications. So let's switch back now to the language of thermodynamics. So what living systems do? So obviously living systems, uh, what do they do? They burn fuel, uh, they produce heat, and that heat is used to produce work. And in this kind of systems, work is activation of pathways. We have all these correlated dynamic systems within our bodies that are stress responses that are required for us to respond to whatever uh, stresses just to survive. The problem is that we want to our pathways to operate like heat engine, meaning that the pathway is activated when it is required, and then it has to go back. And we know that if we want to make it like a steam engine, like a reversible steam engine, we have to, we, there is no way to use all the heat that is produced. Some heat will be dissipated in a useful form, that is entropy, and uh, these high entropy uh, products will be either excreted or some of them will stick. So the high entropy products that stick are called damage. So let's have a look at the damage in single cells. So uh, I'll try to be quick. And this we have just put online uh, because we had to prove. So let, 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 let me think about aging 
and pre-regulational pathways as being pure epigenetics. It's not, but for simplicity, let's think about epigenetics here. So we know that in order to activate a certain pathway to, to, to do work, what they call in thermodynamics, you have to activate a certain pathway. So certain methylation sites have to change their states, and this is now yellow changes. So that produces heat, and by law of thermodynamics, it means that this heat cannot be uh, zero. So this heat now, as noise comes back into the system and tries to activate your DNA in indiscriminate way. So when you pump this pathway many times, as the time goes, you will find that your DNA methylation sites in some unpredictable places will change their states in unpredictable manner. So your pathways will go back and forth, but those low probability events in the rest of your DNA will just keep mounting up. So we predicted a while ago that those uh, stress responses like regular motions, like your piston in your steam engine are pathways that are going back and forth are the yellow states would be highly correlated low entropy because you have lots of control there. You can go up and down, up and down. You can do whatever you want. And we predicted that there will be a bunch of features that are showing up as you live, as you work, as you progress, and they will be accumulating linearly with age. So we were thinking that the yellow features would be those hyperbolic, nonlinear coupled uh, stress responses, and the red features would be uh, entropic and linear or sonium noise. I mean, that was the idea. So first we were, I mean, if you just go to DNA methylation in mice, why mice? Because we have got a single cell methylation data set from mice. Uh, you will have the same situation as with humans. So in mice, if you do just principal components on DNA methylation, you will find that there will be one feature that is exponential. So we believe that this is a pathway. And there will be another feature that is linear with age. So we were hoping that this thing will be the uh, Poissonian noise uh, populated uh, bunch of DNA uh, methylated, demethylated uh, sites. So now, if our prediction is correct, then uh, the sites that are involved in exponential dynamics in the pathway should have high mutual information about each other, right? Because they're changing together. They are part of the pathway. If one of them is activated, others are also activated. Normally, the pathway have all the information how to switch it on and off if required. It's just a problem that mice cannot switch it off, and that's why they're exponentially unstable. But technically, this is a low entropy state. No matter how large is the dynamic, uh, as the range of the dynamic variation. And then, if we were correct, then the linear feature, the sites that are involved in the linear feature should be the sites that have low mutual information about themselves. So what I have now on the on the bottom of this graph is that we took the DNA methylation sites now in single cells. We computed mutual information uh, metrics, one side to all the other sites. Then it's a noisy data. Uh, we averaged it over all the other sites. So we, we've got just one number that is telling how much this site knows about other sites, about the change of states of other sites. And uh, all these sites are now averaged, oh, sorry, ordered from left to right from low mutual information states to the high mutual information states. And now the barcode, I mean, the black lines are all the states that participate in the exponential motion. So you can see that even with the terrible noise that we get from DNA methylation, all the sites that are exponential, that are dynamic, are the high mutual information states. So the states that are co-regulated and the states that are likely to belong to the linear feature are the states that are changing independently, which means that they are just spending exponentially increasing volume in the uh, in the com configurational state, which means that this is pure entropy. And you can actually go to experiments and show that the dynamic features, the yellow features, respond to caloric restriction, I'm not showing it, uh, respond to parabiosis. These are the results from Vadim Gladish lab. You can see here, for example, that the young animals uh, have low pathway, uh, exponential pathway activation than the older animals. But once you do the parabiosis uh, on the left, right after the procedure, the biological age, the exponential feature is lower. And uh, two months after parabiosis, it's still lower. Remember rejuvenation. If you are unstable, there is no way to catch up with the control, which means that you will be always below the control. And that's what this thing is showing. 
And uh, as nasty as it sounds, uh, the entropic feature, the linear feature doesn't care about parabiosis or caloric restriction. Why? Because you cannot revert it. You can only slow it down if it's indeed the entropic process. I'm going to finish now. Maybe I have a few slides. I just want to put you in the general context of science now. Because, uh, well, second order of uh, second law of thermodynamics is a very interesting uh, fundamental physics question. It's a foundation of physics question. Uh, people are testing it uh, all the time. So we have now since a few years uh, gravitational uh, observatories that are observing collisions of black holes. With black holes, it's simple. The entropy is area. And what people are doing, they are comparing the area of black holes before the collision and after the collision. So before the collision is black, after collision is red. And you can see that for all collisions observed, the entropy after the collision is larger than the entropy below before the collision. I believe that we should make the same graph for aging experiments. Our predictions are such that the linear feature, the entropic feature, will always go up. I mean, if we don't see it's going up, it's just because we don't have statistical power, but it's not going to get down. That's important. So that brings us to a very nasty conclusion. We believe that well, aging in mice and humans is kind of not very different. You have the entropic feature and you have the dynamic feature. The problem is that the dynamic feature in mice is exponential, so that's why you only see the dynamic feature in mice, and you test interventions against the dynamic feature. And they work in mice, they can even rejuvenate mice. And we also produced a bunch of experiments. I've shown you some results, so rejuvenation works. We do time-resolved experiments always, because this is the right way to prove that a certain intervention acts against aging, unfortunately. The, oh, fortunately, actually, we are very successful agers. Uh, we don't have exponential features, humans. We are stable, which means that now we have a linear leak. We have a linear entropic feature that dominates aging, that destroys our ability to recover, destroys our resilience and kills us eventually over a very long time. So we don't have an exponential problem. And this thing is unfortunately entropic, which means that over the few next years, there will be infinite number of papers uh, rejuvenating mice. Uh, this will lead to development of drugs that will help people late in life when people are already unstable. This is, of course, a huge both humanitarian uh, achievement and lots of money will be earned. Lots of money are going there, by the way, right now. Lots of people are working on those drugs. But that's not the way to extend human lifespan by two folds, let's say. That's a way how to extend last 10 years of life into last 20 years of life. I mean, that's cool, but that's not what I was thinking about when I came to the field. There will be another bunch of therapeutics that will be working to reduce rate of aging. Remember naked more rats. These guys managed to stop their rate of aging. They are not destroying their regulatory potential at, at, at the rate that we have in humans, which basically puts me two slides and I finished. It puts me into my understanding of the current longevity biotech situation. So basically everyone is uh, separated by ambitions and by beliefs. So on the horizontal axis, I see beliefs. So everyone on the right believes that aging is not reversible. Pharma believes that aging is not reversible and they don't care because it's not reversible. They regress it out and do drugs against diseases. And by the way, they extend human lifespan. They also longevity by it. Right? And then on the left, you, you have guys, let's say less ambitious guys who are doing incremental things like hallmarks of aging, things like that. And then there are uh, dinosaurs, uh, people who believe that aging is reversible and they're channeling billions of dollars in order to revert it in humans. So as one gentleman from Texas said that uh, physics is the law and everything else is recommendation, which means that most of these guys will become pharma because aging is not entirely reversible. There will be very few people, I believe, standing uh, in a few years from now, still thinking about radical life extension in humans with some sort of scientific rational and I believe stopping human aging is a hefty goal that has to be achieved. And I thank you for your attention.